the many levels of equanimity that we try to develop in the practice. We start out with the equanimity that the Buddha describes as being in tune with the elements, like being in tune with earth, being in tune with water, fire, wind. What this means is that these things are non-reactive. If you throw something disgusting on the earth, the earth doesn't react. If you wash disgusting things away with water, the water doesn't react. And similarly with wind and fire. This type of equanimity is a prerequisite for actually being able to do the meditation, because meditation requires that you be very observant. And if you're quick to react and quick to decide you don't like something, you're not going to be able to see anything very clearly in the mind. You have to be able to sit with things, sometimes unpleasant things, before you can figure them out. Work the mind into a state where it can actually find pleasure even when there are unpleasant things around it. So this level of equanimity is needed to be observant. But it's not a kind of equanimity that you can feed on. There's not much pleasure there. The equanimity you can feed on comes either through doing the Brahma Vihara practice or through practicing strong concentration. Because in both cases you have to take the mind first through some pleasant states, feed it with the pleasure, and then there's an equanimity that comes with being full. It's a very subtle pleasure that goes with the equanimity, and it's the kind that you can actually feed on. For instance, while we're working with the breath. In the beginning you want to get the breath so that it's pleasurable. And there's a sense of real refreshment that comes with staying with the breath. Because otherwise, if you try to develop equanimity, then the equanimity gets very, very dry and it's hungry. When the mind is hungry, it will stay with equanimity only through willpower. And then it'll go slipping off. And then when the mind goes slipping off like that, it just goes back to its old likes and dislikes. Because it needs, this, it needs some food, it needs some nourishment of some kind. So what you have to learn how to do is feed the mind well with a sense of comfort, a sense of refreshment with the breath. These are part of the Buddha's instructions on mindfulness of breathing. And as he says, if you don't have this kind of pleasure to fall on, or to feed on, this kind of rapture or refreshment to feed on, then no matter how much you understand the drawbacks of sensual pleasures, you're going to go back to them. And the equanimity that comes from insight is not enough. It needs to be backed up by the skills that come from learning how to breathe well, and learning how to breathe in a way that really feels nourishing for the body. And is nourishing for the mind. Sometimes you hear people warning you away from the pleasures of, of jhana practice, saying that you're going to get stuck because the pleasure is so great. But that's really foolish. Of course you want to get stuck on these pleasures, because otherwise what pleasures are you going to be stuck on? The pleasures of sensual thoughts, sensual passions, sensual objects. The pleasure of John is a lot safer. Nobody's killed or stolen or engaged in illicit sex or lied or gotten drunk because of the pleasure of jhana. But the pleasures of sensuality can cause those things. In fact, that's they're the main reason why we have so much strife in the world. People are stuck on sensual pleasures. So you've got to wean the mind away from those kind of pleasures and provide it an alternative. When you feed the mind well, this is a sense of ease that comes from 
breathing well, and this can be done in lots of different ways. You can work with the rhythm of the breath, or you can work from the outside in. In other words, think of the breath energy flowing in your arms and legs, just kind of relaxing around the process of breathing. Relax your arms, relax your legs, start with the feet, start with the hands, and come into the center. And the breath will find a good rhythm on its own. But it is something you fabricate. In other words, you do work on this. You adjust the conditions so that it feels good breathing in, feels good breathing out, feels good just sitting here, inhabiting your body, inhabiting the form of the body. And allow yourself to gain a, a, an appreciation for this level of pleasure, this level of refreshment. As the Buddha says, you indulge in it. And helps you to stabilize the mind. And as the mind gets more stable, it, it reaches a point where it doesn't need that much of the pleasure or the refreshment or the rapture or whatever. It's like drinking your full of water. And then you've had enough and you don't need any water anymore. Then you can be equanimous about the water. The water's there if you ever need it, but you'll be equanimous about it. This kind of equanimity comes with a sense of fullness. This is the kind of equanimity you can feed on. The same with the equanimity in the Brahma Viharas. You start with goodwill and compassion and empathetic joy. You don't go straight to equanimity. Because feelings of goodwill are nourishing. Feelings of compassion are nourishing. Feelings of empathetic joy. When you realize that you don't need to feed on resentment anymore. You can actually feed off the happiness of other people. All of these are uplifting for the mind. But they have to be backed up by equanimity, and the equanimity needs them too, otherwise it gets dry. The reason they need to be backed up by equanimity is that there are many times when you see people who are suffering, or other times when you are suffering, and you can't do anything about it. You can't let yourself get worked up. Or there are cases where you see that people are happy, but you realize it's not going to last. You realize there are cases where you have pleasures and happiness that are not going to last. We have to meet those with equanimity. But again, this comes not from just telling yourself to be non-reactive or not caring. You feed the mind well to the point where it can actually feed off the equanimity. And then you can live in the world and not have to suffer so much from it. Because we live in a world where we're not the only ones subject to aging, illness, and death. The people all around us are. And many of them are people we love, people who have been good to us. When you come up against these things, you can't just say, well, be equanimous and leave it at that. That's going back to the old non-reactive equanimity, which is not all that nourishing. That's not all that stable. You need to be able to feed the mind from within so that its food source is independent. So when you're with people who are suffering, especially people who are close to you, people in your family, very close friends. You can actually be of more help if you have this kind of equanimity behind you. It's in this way that equanimity can be a social virtue. It's the equanimity that allows you not to have to feed off your relationships with other people. We're mentioning today that story about Sariputta talking about how he was sitting one afternoon realizing there was nothing whose change in the world would cause his mind any grief. Ananda heard this and immediately said, what if anything happened to the Buddha? And Sariputta said, well, it would be a shame that such a great being would have to pass away, someone who's done so much good for the world. But that's the nature of fabricated things. And Ananda's response was, this is a sign that Sariputta has gone beyond conceit. Points out the fact that many times our suffering compassion or our grief over what's happening to 
the people we love. It has an awful lot to do with our own idea of who we are and how our identity builds around either the compassion or builds around our relationship with the other person. In other words, sometimes there's a sense of pleasure that comes from knowing, well, I'm compassionate. You've probably been a victim of some people's compassion like this. They're feeding off the idea that they're good people, they're generous people, they're compassionate people, but what they're doing for you is not all that helpful. It has more to do with them than it does with you. Then there's the other case, of course, where your identity is so bound up in that other person that the idea of their suffering is like a huge chunk of you is suffering. Or their, the loss of them is going to be a huge gaping hole in you. And this is because, what, what does that gaping hole come from? It comes from where you're feeding off the other person, you're feeding off the relationship, you're feeding off your sense of who you are. This is one of the things, one of the reasons we need equanimity as a social, vir social virtue. Learn how to feed off of that so that you're in a better position to see well, what actually needs to be done right now. It doesn't mean you don't care. It means that you have to have your own well-being being well established before you can see what the other person needs, what can be done, what's the best thing to do in any particular situation. So this is the kind of equanimity that comes not simply from saying, I'm going to be non-reactive. It comes from feeding the mind well, either with the Brahma Viharas or with good breath energy as you get the mind into jhana, which is one of the reasons why these practices are not selfish. Because if your mind is not in a turmoil, you can see things more clearly. You see what's needed, what's possible, and how best to do it a lot more clearly. And if you're still feeding off the compassion or feeding off your sense of identity that's built around the other person. So these skills we're developing here, how to get a sense of well-being with the breath, how to use that to feed the mind well so it can reach a state of equanimity. These are beneficial not only for us, but for all the people around us. To try to develop the kind of equanimity that you can feed on, that comes from a sense of plenitude inside. You will benefit, the people around you will benefit too.